This is Podkit, episode 63, every year since January 1st, on Saturday, December 19th, 2020. And now, this is The Way. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, Ryan Rampersad, and guest Zach Scalco. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk63. Hello, Podkit. Today we are joined by a special guest, our second guest ever on Podkit, which is, you know, actually kind of wild for the fact that we've been doing this for five years, but here we are. We have Zach Skelko. Hey, y'all. I like that Zach waves on the podcast. It's very, (laughs) very soundful. Yes. Now we've all heard it. You've got to get the whole body into the mood of... Into the mix. ...being greeted, right? Otherwise, I'm going to just be anxiously over here going, uh, hi, hi. Uh, even though we chatted for like an hour and I was fine. Right. Literally nothing has changed during that chat. That was being recorded too. It's just, now you know. Now it's official. Uh-oh. Now this is the audio where I will be listening to it at least once more as I edit the show. At least once. Oh, this is going to be a lot longer of an edit with four people. Oh, well. Wow. Anyway, we thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about some of our favorite tech this year since it's what we're recording this towards the end of December. I'm not sure when it'll be released, but probably still in 2020, maybe. Only you will know. And yes, yeah, so we can kind of look back at the year. It's been it's been a not really a normal year, but we've all been working still, and so there's some stuff we can maybe talk about a bit. Anyone want to start with with anything? Yeah, I guess I've got some stuff. Why not? Um, so for me, probably the coolest thing that's happened this year uh, in terms of work has to be the proliferation of like remote dev tools. So. It's been really, really, really easy to use like Visual Studio Code's remote um, extension to do things like, oh, you know, I, I keep most of my work on my DigitalOcean VPS that's like walled off from the rest of the world. And then no matter what computer I'm using to access it, I just shell into the, my VPS, my server, and I work on it from there. And I, it's not strictly speaking a like, you know, a dev tool like it's not strictly speaking like something I use for work or need to use for work or that changes necessarily the product, but it definitely makes it quite a bit easier for me to work no matter what machines available to me, which is pretty cool. Even though I'm not going anywhere, you know, with the pandemic and everything, it's been really nice to do that. And it also makes it easy to share your work. So definitely shout out to the VS Code team for that stuff. I think what I like about that the most is that it makes your like local dev environment have like extreme parity with your lower environments or higher environments. Like it is the same, same machine or, you know, conglomeration of machines that you're developing on when you're developing locally. I'm doing air quotes. Again, it's a podcast. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's actually a really good way to put it because, like, the, you know, maybe more broadly, right? Like Firebase and uh, Amplify and you know whoever else, whatever whatever platform you pick, everyone's really been working hard on making the either making your local environment emulate what's happening when you actually deploy it, um, especially like with a serverless approach, but. I think maybe the most interesting part is a lot of those a lot of those systems, right? Like I know um, AJ Stevenberg of Serverless likes to really talk up, you know, the idea of like you you know you shouldn't really want to use the emulator. Eventually, you should, you know, change your mindset so that you're comfortable developing actually in an AWS account and like push all of your stuff up there and let it do its thing. And I think there's kind of a similar push on the Firebase side. And and elsewhere to to kind of think about developing in the cloud when you actually do your work, and this is kind of an interesting extension of that. But you know, there's some stuff that, for various reasons, you know, you're not actually going to have an Amazon account. You're not deploying to AWS. You're not deploying to Firebase. You're not deploying to Azure. And so it's for that kind of thing that I think those VS Code Dev tools works. But I think like overall in 2020, we've seen a push for like individual dev environments in the cloud. That's also been kind of along those same lines. Anyway, uh, I'm also going to shout out Svelte. So I've been using Svelte on a couple projects recently, particularly that mixtape maker that I think I shared back in the fall. And Svelte is actually pretty slick. I know Brian's used it a little bit on some stuff. Maybe others have used it too. But I think in terms of 
a simplification of sorts of a lot of the same sort of ideas that like react and view and a lot of other modern frameworks have kind of like tried to address it's really nice to <laughs> just kind of walk everything back a little bit when maybe um you're sick and tired of the react ecosystem as i sometimes can be um so shout out to svelte for that too and last but not least is tailwind wait no i want to talk about svelte too you want to talk about svelte okay let's do it <laughs> what, what, what do you got so i i feel i've i've used it for very small things and i like it in concept but i am still having a hard time wrapping my head around how it scales into a larger application mm -hmm. simply because of the way that it like it almost does encapsulation too well um that the idea of shared state widely throughout the application it just and maybe it's that it just doesn't have the user ecosystem around it enough that mm -hmm. i haven't read or seen as much uh about how to do that like patterns haven't developed in from what i've seen around how to scale that up to a whole application now if i wanted to build a micro front end thing i feel like yes please let me pick felt for this because it's uh but tell me i'm wrong because i want to be wrong because i want because Svelte has a lot to like about it yeah i'm pretty excited about like sapper i don't know if you checked out sapper at all that I think is it's like the Svelte answer to like Next.js in some ways. So it helps out a little bit with some of that stuff, but I think you're right. It's, it's still kind of early days, kind of like Elm was a couple of years ago, where really, you know, a lot of a lot of the content about it is a lot of like micro front end type stuff. And I think that's, you know, like you said, it's not necessarily a problem, but I, th I think, you know, maybe in 2021, we'll see a little bit a little bit more. Um, around that, I know there are some people out there who are really excited about and um, backing Sapper and Svelte. So I think that should be really interesting. So a funny thing about Sapper is that Rich Harris, on one of the conferences that we don't go to anymore, but that are online now, he sure. said that Sapper will never have a 1.0 version and they're not going to do it. And they're going to roll <laughs> all of that tech into mainline Svelte itself. Oh. Now, I don't know what that means, but uh, apparently that's a good thing, I guess. Right. I mean, it, make, it makes sense because Sapper, because it's kind of like the the full fledged application framework of yeah. sorts, or that's the that's the dream for it. Right. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that eventually, you know, there's not going to be a need for it to be a separate thing if there's kind of, you know, tacit agreement that, yeah, no, this is this is kind of the way that people will build it. They can probably make some compiler optimizations and, and stuff too that makes it a lot more efficient when you just pull it into official and say this is the way it's going to work versus we have to create this whole interface to let things hook into it or whatever. I don't know. Not to not to compare and contrast too starkly with React, but I think like <laughs> one of the one of the things that I think is exciting to me about this is that it is a little bit more opinionated. It's a little bit less like. It, it, you know, it definitely has some of the same like personality cult vibes that React has for sure. It's um, a different cult though. It's a different, it's a different cult and it kind of seems to have formed at it's least in very part a reaction to it. Yeah. It's very, it's a very rich cult. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> uh, good one. Um, but I think like there's, there's a lot to be said for like the notion that, you know, like as this approaches the stated goals, right. Um, you know, we're going to end up with something that looks a lot more like a, uh, an application framework and a lot less like a fancy templating a, yeah a collection of fancy templating stuff and the things around it and you mix and match to create what becomes your application framework mm -hmm. and then you have 37 different expressions of this one thing <laughs> it is kind of funny how we um as a community oscillate between like uh bring your own whatever you want and then also on the other extreme everything is set in stone and an opinionated or here you go good luck right you go and back so and you forth because you get tired of the extremes of one yeah and you go with exactly the extremes you of the look other. at like uh where we were with angular and it's like uh you got to do everything the angular way or rails like you look back even just a little further right like it this is the way and you do it this way and it works and it's great and why why are you trying to do anything else because this is what you need this is a website. It's funny though. I recently at work, someone was asking me for, you know, is there is there like a React like architecture or design <laughs> style guide? Uh, and I and I 
thought about it for a minute and I said, well, yeah, it's kind of just uh, whoever your lead engineer is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is like both good and bad. Um, but what does it mean to have a style guide for that? Like, right. would you ever ask somebody is like, is there a spring style guide? Well, no, because the spring, because spring itself is opinionated enough to be able to express there is a spring way to do a thing. Yeah, and there's a right? React way to do a thing. Yeah, but there's also four other React ways to do that thing. Um, back to, I got, I got to get back to this before it loses, uh, runs out of my head about, um, about Svelte though, and that I do have concerns that it is diverging from the JavaScript language too far. Mm. Um, Say what you will about JSX, it's just another way to write a function and give it arguments. Um, but the way that uh, Svelte has co-opted like actual keywords mm -hmm. to mean something else inside of inside of its application spooky. is scary to me. Mm -hmm. The use of like spooky. labels and the export being kind of an import. Exactly. And, yeah. Export already means something. <laughs> yeah. It, it is that is pretty spooky i think it is a it is kind of a fine uh, a small distinction but it it could potentially be pretty impactful i think you're you're right about that that is that is a little bit spooky but if it works kind of like jsx right if it if it works and it lands then you know maybe maybe it won't be as big an issue but i i agree with you that you know we we might see for example svelte be treated more like its own language even if it mostly mm -hmm. Um, maps to JavaScript in certain ways, right? Yeah, it's got the it's got a lot of the JavaScript APIs and the window APIs, but really don't read MDN to try and learn Svelte. <laughs> that's well, it's yeah, kind of no, like the um, the single file components structure that Vue had that made it very popular when it came out. Uh, but on the other hand, it it does a little bit different because in in Vue the script section was just javascript and he just made a view object but now in in svelte it's a some of that syntax can be a little strange right i'd definitely like to try playing around with building out a little more my svelte experience is a single component that <laughs> that does one thing and that is it fetches data in a promise and it either resolves or it rejects and it displays it a success or an error message and that's all it does so it's the like most basic but and like rewriting in Svelte uses more JavaScript than what I had in vanilla JS before. Sure. But it was something fun and it was easier to look at the code that I did write. So that's why I did there. But I, it'd be nice to to integrate a few more integrating together, having some state. Um, I'm always looking out for something like that I can put on my site. I don't know. I think the next kind of interactive thing I build, if if I ever do that, I'll look at Svelte for it just to prove it out a little bit more. But. The last thing I was going to mention is Tailwind, but I think I'm going to let uh, everybody else take that because the the thing I'll say is that Tailwind has really made it. I I really value Tailwind for its kind of structure, not not even necessarily you know because like a common criticism of Tailwind is that oh yeah well it's just you know you should just know how to write CSS and then you don't need Tailwind. But I'm glad I'm here to help relitigate this. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry, everybody does. Oh, this will be fun. This will be fun, right? My argument is that most people who know CSS, you, you can know CSS and still not have any idea what you're doing as far as having a, uh, like uh, typography, size, scales, or color gradations or anything like that. And when you have those boundaries, it's a lot easier to make something that looks good because I wager most people who say things like, oh, well, you know, tail Tailwind is more confusing to me than CSS and I, you, know, you should just learn CSS, um, make some shit websites and their designers hate them and, and i took that personally is what I took that personally. Yeah, exactly. so there you go that's all i'll say about tailwind anyhow next next contestant um i i don't disagree i like it um yes you should also learn css though and tail you should use tailwind to make it easier to apply the what you know about css yeah um yeah I don't know how you could use Tailwind without knowing CSS. It seems impossible. Exactly. Yeah. Tailwind is all of the utility classes that you could have been writing yourself, but you just didn't. 
that you end up writing yourself incrementally yeah, over the lifetime of a project anyway. So, mm -hmm. but yep. but they're like they're more thought out and they're they're consistent in naming Ish. and how they're implemented in a way that you doing it yourself probably doesn't account for. It is it is funny you say that because I've been a part of projects that have written those utilities. And they wrote their own utilities, even though we were using a framework, you know, CSS framework that actually had those utilities. They just never looked it up. Oh, funny. Oops. <laughs> and I, I think that actually is what's what's really good about it. We talked a little bit about what, like, what does your front end architecture look like? Like the idea that I could walk from one project to another project and see that I'm using Tailwind in both and understand already how to do this thing in this project, that totally accelerates that like your ability to grok a project mm -hmm. i think what what what's interesting about that i haven't actually had that experience where somebody's else somebody else already had something started with tailwind and then i've come into it but it seems to me like if somebody actually had a really truly custom design they would have changed out a lot of the tokens like you mm -hmm. know a lot of the individual things so like because structurally you would know like this is a tailwind project and so all the things are going to be tokens but you're going to have to go and learn this new set of tokens and some might overlap but some also might have new meanings and some might just be new but i think you'd have to do that in in any situation right so ryan i think that means you're going next oh okay well i mean i like tailwind too and um you know tailwind had kind of the 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 journey that adam wathan sort of wrote about in his i don't know it's almost a manifesto if you want to call it that we like that word here right oh yeah uh <laughs> zach liked it and <laughs> oh yeah smiling does not come across on the <laughs> podcast again right yes um and so so adam had you know this this whole like incremental history like let's write structured html and let's write you know stylistic css and let's put you know some classes in there and okay now let's make them semantic and okay now let's make them all like componentized semantic and now this sucks because i can't reuse them between things that have technically different semantic meanings and now i have to water down the semantics to make it all work out and and so inevitably you just start making little utilities to represent what you want to change in you know incrementally um so Tailwind really worked for me there. You know, I tried Tachyons actually before this, uh, and I, I tried it. Like, I knew I wanted a utility framework, and Tachyons was the thing that was around, but it didn't work out for me. And then I tried Style Components, and I love Style Components in the sense that, like, they're really... I still, lo I still love Style Components. Yeah, I mean, they're really, really helpful little self-exporting, you know, things. They're cool. But what's weird about style components for me today is that like they're tied to a tag and then you can like convert your tag to another tag and that's all weird. Like there should be another higher level thing that's disjoint from elements. And then Tailwind sort of kind of fits in there where it's individual discrete tokens and you can just pump them in and do whatever you want. I still don't think Tailwind is the final form of what we're looking for here. It's um, getting there. But it, I think Tailwind suffers from the post-CSS syndrome, where it's all this kind of ad hoc generated thing, and it's not like uh, an AST that can be consumed and then reproduced in, with some other tool. So I, I, I think it, it's, there's still something that's going to come up that's going to be better, but influenced by this heavily. And now when you go to any of my websites, uh, you'll see that there's Ryan TM design all over it. RDD, Ryan Driven Development. Yeah. Uh, so a, a fun thing to actually look at is my main website, ryanrampersed.com, and the card website, because one is written with style components, and one is written with Tailwind, but they look effectively identical, and that's kind of the point. Like, you can you can do anything in either. That's just a different philosophy that powers it. D design doesn't matter about how you implement it. Like, it's what you're going for. But yeah, Tailwind is flexible enough. I mean, it's just, yeah, utility everything, every property, it's... Ultimately, the output is a web page with styles. So it turns out how you get there. Um, I think traditionally the way that like CSS and JS tools have thought about like styling as it's part of the tree and your DOM is part of the tree and all of it is part of this tree. But I think what a tool like Tailwind allows you to do is think about your tree as more of your like application state mm -hmm. and have your styling uh sort of be uh 
fine orthogonal to that um where (laughs) um podcast over so you can think about your like your tree your jsx tree or component tree whatever uh, as like your pure application state and not so much the display side of that you can Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really nice. And it gets a little, you know, a little fuzzy in places uh, where those kind of parallel trees or orthogonal trees kind of intersect because, you know, how often do we use class names to go and do some dynamic tailwinds classes? Well, I do it all the time and it's real weird. Um, and I know I know it, when I've done style components where I need something really dynamic, where I need to change like a property in terms of, uh, you know, percentages and you know um i need to actually do math and stuff like then then you know tailwinds is almost useless it it doesn't work for that but and you run into those problems but it i guess it's good good to know that tailwinds solves like this you know middle 90 and then there are some solutions on the outside of that that's okay it solves virtually all of your layout right Yeah. yeah and like and sometimes like when you're talking about that like really coupled like application state and visual state like at that point you're not doing layout you're doing of dynamic visualization right. or you're drawing a bitmap on the screen you're not exactly making a web page exactly so yeah. yeah different tools for different jobs good work zach we did it cool the next one you have here ryan do you want to start on that or no, should no, no. i you, you should start on this is this, this okay. your 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 thing we, we've we all looked into react query this year i think that's really kind of taken the react ecosystem by storm it's uh i guess frequently compared to is with uh, swr the stale while revalidate pattern from vercel is that who made it we can still call it zeit it's okay guillermo zeit? can't okay. hurt us anymore <laughs> so it kind of takes that similar pattern but lets you do way more with it so it's like a, a server state management tool inside of your application there's tons of utilities around cache invalidation and prefetching data and all this kind of stuff and it's been really nice and it it pulls away all of these like async fetch stuff out of your own code and you can use this library instead um so i've used it a lot at work and talked to some others about it it's been pretty great uh, less code than Redux for stuff that doesn't really need to be in Redux. That's kind of the the whole point too. So well, and you get a lot of value, like a lot of uh, like user experience helpers out of it. And you get all this loading state management. And and I I heard about this thing like four years ago, COVID time, I believe. Uh, what was it called? Suspense. <laughs> Pretty sure that never showed up, but that was supposed to kind of help with this kind of thing, and it never did. So React Query kind of helps in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah, there's this like retry handling with exponential back off and you know, you can you can show your stale data but it's still in the cache while you refetch the new stuff. Yeah, it's been pretty great and it's gotten extremely popular this year. I think it was I don't 1.0 was was this year, but I think Tanner Lindsley released the earlier versions I think as far back as like September 2019 maybe. So it's really kind of gotten very popular that's been fun to see fun to use well i think it took off for me when it when when i found out that they removed the uh, spyware that was integrated and and like i couldn't recommend it to anybody until that was gone like i i uh, uh, i love open source tools but i can't have analytics code in my can you tell me a little bit more about like exactly what spyware (laughs) was there because that's actually yeah yeah i think I, i hit react query a little late on the and that's yeah. good because though it's gone now. But I, I don't remember what version it was removed in, but I started using it in early like 2.0. So it was gone by then. And the spyware prior to that had been something called Scarf.js. Pretty sure that's what it's called. And it 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 would basically kind of call run a callback like a post install script, right? Uh whenever you would install React Query and it would, you know, just beam the IP address back to, you know, the scarf js analytics server Mm. thing um and and so it was a way to find out like what big entities were using the system and that's fine like that's cool like get get your analytics but just not from my literal computer please thank you yeah 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 right and i think like another part to it that was kind of cringy too is like there was all this talk of like oh yeah well then you'd hit them up and ask them for money basically which in a that's not how any of this works. Right. In a vacuum, I'm like, 
yes, I think, you know, large companies should support the open source tools that enable their business. Yeah, yeah absolutely. hundred percent. I think, you know, there's kind of some, you know, LinkedIn rando messaging vibes sometimes yeah. whenever that happens. Or like, I don't know, like if this all ever happened to you all, but like when I was at the U sometimes, um, even as a, even as a student, I would get inquiries from like technology companies because yep. I don't know, my email address must be out there for some reason in, in connection with, you know, technology at the U of M. Right. And, um, and it would be people basically hitting us up, trying to sell software. All the and time. now I had no budget, right. Cause I was a student, like I'm not, I have no decision-making power for any of this crap. Right. Like, you know, leave me alone. Um, it has kind of those same sort of vibes. And, you know, I think you can argue that the power dynamics a little bit different there, but like, I mean, man, you know, if I used react query during the time that it had scarf in there, you know, my IP address would probably show up as like Comcast or CenturyLink or whoever. And yeah, sure. By all means hit up Comcast <laughs> yeah. for money. Like good, good luck. Good. Let's do that. Let's, let's shadow ourselves as Comcast. That's actually a good idea. Yep. There you go. It should be easy to do. And then that has the, the added benefit of wasting time for some terrible companies which <laughs> you know and so I'm like i don't want to overblow the whole spyware thing but uh i think it's important. but that's bad it it's, is, it's bad it's bad like when well, there are so many options and if you can use your download to inform the market that you do not want that as an option please do it right um and and so now what tanner has is you know they have like a course thing you know it's a bunch of videos that's a very popular way to get some revenue I'm sure he does some like open collective stuff or the GitHub sponsors thing. Yep. Um, so that's good. And uh, he has a big enterprise tier that hopefully somebody will pick up, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, the developers like you, you, you know, you and, and, and all of us here, we don't have the, the power to like tell our company to go and pay for this or, you know, fund it. So we're kind of opening up our businesses to, spyware intrusion by using this open source stuff but we have no no alternative means to do it otherwise i've tried a little bit in in my company to to try to get sponsoring open source stuff but it's it's totally like a out of our goodness of our heart there's no like no obligation there's no culture of let's spend one developer salary on donating to all these open source tools that if they didn't exist, none of our front ends would exist at yeah. all in the current state. It would it would definitely cost us more than one front ends uh one front end developer's salary to build all of these tools internally. So for sure. I mean and, and it wouldn't be even as good because literally the experts that build libraries are different than the experts that build enterprise software. And uh, what, what one of my favorite things is to, like our our business as well, uh, at least for those who work work in uh, enterprises. Hi Brandon. Um our our enterprise businesses will buy an Oracle license for ten thousand dollars a month, and it's like, okay, and not even blink at it. Yeah, here you go, have fun. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the other the other thing about that that makes it maybe a little bit different too is like, and you know, this is this is it's it's pretty dark, right? But like, you know, it's the, there's a little bit clearer of a through line to things like Oracle makes contact with the people who do purchasing. Is exactly. The Yep. yep. And they're and you know they're basically a law firm, right? And that's that's how they make their money is through Don't give Tanner any ideas. So yeah, so <laughs> so Facebook and you know yeah, the Tan stack, all those people what they need to do is hire a ton of lawyers and go directly at purchasing and say, "Hey, you know, there you go." And then and then you then you win. Then you're in. Which and then you know, maybe win in air quotes. Win. And then your entire community leaves It's you. it's the yeah. conflict of open source and and private source, you know, like only a commercial product versus being open source. I think part of the reason why a lot of the front end libraries are so popular is because they're open source and free to use. So it's it needs that as well. So yeah, you learn on it and then you use it. Keep going, right? Like yeah. Um I, I think one of the other problems though with like finding like how do you, how do we choose what to donate to? Like, say we had this discretionary fund uh, that for some reason we as engineers were in charge of passing out, like, what would we even pick? Like, frankly, my stack looks substantially different uh, every three months yeah. in terms of yeah. what I'm using. So, like, how do you, like, 
part of the reason that Oracle is getting this money is because you always go with Oracle, right? Like it's it's a simple uh, choice, right? Like in three months, I might not be re using React Query. I might be using generic tokenized uh, API fetch cache that Powered isn't tied suspense. directly to React, right? Like, um, So React Query v3, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, like like high up leadership in, in IT departments and things doesn't realize the, the turnover in front end code and how much it changes. Well, most people don't even realize that you need to engineer a front end. But yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, let's not go there today, Zach. We'll come back to that next uh, month. There's, there's one last thing I can fit in on this is that I think, so some of us, you know, you made the joke about everyone but me being an enterprisey person. I'm going to, I'm going to make a joke, sorry, Brian, about, you know, those of us who are in client service and those of us who are on the, I guess, Zach, technically you're on the, um, you're, oh, I'm sold you're on out, the man, they, they own me. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, but you've, you've had substantial client service time, right? Um, mm -hmm. and you know, probably there's some echoes of that to some degree, but you know, the other side to it too, is like, you know, even me as a client service provider, right. As a vendor, like I negotiate all my own rates and fees and stuff like that. And a thing that I think would be interesting. And a thing that I think I've seen work really well is the craft CMS model. You, you all ever see mm -hmm. craft CMS? Yeah. Yep. PHP something or other, but they have a, they have like a free license that you can get as a individual and you're good like that gets you that gets you in the door and you can mess around with it and do the thing and then they have a paid tier that is i think really intelligently targeted towards the folks who are usually implementing craft cms sites which are agencies small agencies individuals and so you have a predictable fee free till you scale up Yep, and that has a predictable fee for all of that sort of things that funds development. Now, I don't have any information whatsoever on how Craft CMS is doing as an entity, but um, kind of as we're talking about this, I feel like maybe I need to start putting my money where my mouth is on this very literally and start working in like donations to open source as part of my yeah uh, part of my fee. And that's something that I can control because I'm I'm different and I don't need to ask anybody permission for it. I just say this is my fee. Is that even something you can? pawn off and say hey <laughs> uh please um this is part of your fee we can consider it we uh based on the license and the entity that's supporting it we could perhaps consider this a donation that you as a uh someone who is buying my services could apply to your tax season no no i no, don't no, no, no. i don't know if... not to that degree, not to that degree. <laughs> i don't know if those are donations get the though. lawyers involved no yeah. you want to talk go get legal man like i said like you said go get okay, right. yeah, that's true. <laughs> is open collective a 501c3 github probably isn't but uh, i think the hard thing about doing the you know working the kind of the, the donation value into your own rates, I think, you know, as a consultant who gets billed out at some rate too, like I can, I can imagine, you know, getting billed out at X and then I, I, I but what I can't imagine is uh, my director saying, okay, well, hi client, Ryan's going to get billed out at X and then you're also going to have to pay this Y fee so that we can support all of the open source stuff that Ryan's going to use. Like there's no way they're ever going to talk to us again. That's the thing. No, they would just say Ryan's going to be be billed at X plus one and then pass it out. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But I, I feel like then we won't be competitive in the market compared to others. So sell yourself as a ethically responsible <laughs> independent I, consultant. I'm pretty sure they have He's a, a free range, non GMO uh, <laughs> <laughs> consultant. Well, see, they, they have an algorithm Certified and the algorithm organic. sorts those developers to the bottom of the list. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you to, to a degree, but like. I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get at is like a lot of a lot of slices of the industry already do this. And the other side to it too is I think there are folks for whom I mean, so in Craft CMS, for example, that's an annual fee, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, at that point the client's probably going to be buying it because they want their website to stay up. But I think there's substantial, especially on fixed bid projects, right? Right. You know, if it's just a one time thing, you know, you don't even have to change your rate necessarily. And then it's individual now. Yeah. yeah. Like if it's a material cost i think that's better but i think it's harder to justify you know something like open collective or the the github thing if it's if it if it's monthly like that would be weird for them if it's a one-time thing it's easier yeah. but it's also hard because like you're not getting anything from react query for example in return you're just saying well here's your money and go have a nice life yeah well and 
I don't think you need to even mention it at that point. Yeah. In React Query specific, I think Tanner does is or is trying to have like private support channels and stuff if you donate a certain amount. Yeah. So there's a little bit of like of a negotiation contract kind of thing there. But that's at the five thousand yeah. dollar tier. Yeah. It's like TPT, but for <laughs> React packages. Yeah. One more one more thing on the React Query stuff and analytics. So like the docs sites, they all have Google Analytics or whatever analytics they have. Yep. So they already know who you are there. But I would say No, they don't. I block them. Yes, yeah, so ad blockers you you can block. Now Scarf you could block as well. I think I don't know if Scarf is still around. Um, it looked really early product when Tanner was using it with React Query. You don't know that you're being tracked there in, unless you read about the library and look at these weird options and set an environment variable. Whereas, like, yeah, in a, in a browser, it's a little more expected. So it's just kind of the new thing, you know, new expectations. If npm gave all this information to every package owner, you know, then it would just if somehow everyone got on board with that, then that would just be the thing, and then it would be fine. But it's the like the new new places of tracking and stuff. And I'd say, yeah, it's kind of not it's, you know, it's it's frowned upon. Um, it might be nice to see more stats out of NPM. I don't know. But so you're saying I need to read the docs before just installing random playing stuff. With the thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, I think that if that were to happen, like if NPM or, or Yarn or somebody would somehow intercept all of the stuff, everybody would just further cement themselves into having proxies between them and and the the main repositories like it's just not okay yeah there's a degree to that like i I think i see a little bit of what brian's trying to say in terms of like a lot of this has to do with expectations right like we already we already know that like google analytics is pretty ubiquitous and so and we have mitigation strategies for it and it's the i mean like homebrew cli on mac os uses google analytics sure and that's a command line utility and stuff so I, I think the boundary crossing stuff is when it starts to like the when that's used as lead generation. I think that's yeah. that you know, because like remarketing, that's a thing that's a thing we know about, right? Like that's you know, the same reason why, you know, you see an Instagram post and it mentions, I don't know, um, that like milk bar cake, right? And then you start seeing that milk bar ad everywhere. Like that's that's one thing, right? And it's the it's the that leading to conversations with your manager, your manager's manager, your CTO, or your procurement folks. Should we buy milk bars? <laughs> that's that's the thing that fuels boundary crossing because and, and I think to flip that on its head, maybe that's part of the problem is that we is that this is an industry that's so, you know, in a lot of ways the developers are kind of making procurement decisions mm-hmm. in the sense that we're procuring free shit, right? Yeah. Um <laughs> and a lot of the discomfort I think people feel about that is around the discomfort of taking of of this thing that we felt like we had this like social contract for lack of a better phrase around and then placing a more traditional kind of procurement model around it. And, you know, a lot of these decisions to individuals don't seem very heavy, but you know, compounded, they can, they can be quite heavy and that can manifest as like stuff that doesn't get maintained. And then it's like, oh crap, you know, now we have to figure this out because somebody made a bad decision that they didn't know would be a bad decision at the time, right? But, you know, kind of more broadly, right? Like, what position does that put the maintainer in, right? Because the maintainer's like, I, I don't know how to monetize this, right? Like, there's there's a there's a reasonable thing on that side, I think, being mostly on the, on the consumer side of it, right? Like, part of the reason why it works is that there's nothing, is that there's no expectation in, of, of payment in return. Part of, that's part of why it works, and that's part of why people try. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, nobody has answers for this, and that's why people are trying trying stuff, I guess. I think I've uncovered my 2021 mission, which is to get developers a budget to spend on open source. Good plan. hey Looking forward to it. Like, that would just be nice. Like, That'd if I great. could just, if yeah. I, as a, like, I can know, okay, in my project, I'm spend, I'm doing this. I should be able to allocate funds to it because I'm not going to, my project's not going to be able to allocate four front-end engineers to build a uh, DOM framework, so please help me. Well, uh, I mean, you think about it, Zach. Like, our run rate, for example, is a number that would fund Tanner's max tier. Mm-hmm. Done. Great. Cool. Fun. Yeah, and I think, like, what, I, I think that's the, that's the difficulty. You think of, like, product companies like Twilio or Netlify or other companies that employ developer evangelists, right? Like the entire profession of developer evangelism or developer advocacy is around the notion that like 
in order for pe- like the the decision makers might not be developers but for the places where the developers are the decision makers and can pick te- technologies there'll be massive there'll be massive returns on any investment you put in creating goodwill among developers and then eventually it you know it might start with places that where developers can make those decisions and then eventually you'll become so solidified like netlify has become that places that do have procurement shops are like oh yeah no these people are legit they have you know they just got another 80 million dollars from god knows who and you know they might not exist tomorrow right they might mm-hmm. <laughs> they might get saddled with that and and shut down you know it, it's it's a it's a weird virtuous cycle of legitimacy that starts with places where developers can make those decisions and ends in piles and piles of cash you know you think about front end masters that i think is a huge 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 um donor to uh, open collective right like they're they're you see them everywhere they pop up all all the live long day right and they've supported jsmn and lots of other groups they're a fundamentally different model though they're a service model they're not a like software is not their product but they also understand software right mm. broadly in the business Right, right, right. And so, and I think, I think that's interesting too, because then you have, you know, you have something where there's like an orthogonality to it. Oh no, that again. As, as some might say. Yeah, yeah. I just had to throw that word in there. (laughs) Where like, you know, if, if a company that certainly relies on open source software, but might not rely necessarily on the tools that they're backing, you know, and and they back a lot of the stuff that they do use too, it seems like. But when it's viewed as a community expenditure, that's pretty cool. Right, like that's the you know if, if they can do it, why can't places that are minor technical difficulties? We're gonna continue on with a new topic. I think we have to let Zach have his turn now. Yeah, Zach, it's your turn. Okay, so I had a bunch of cool things, or there were a bunch of like cool, cool things that I got to work with this year, um, and then some that I like just squeezed in at the end of the year. But actually, I think like the most impactful one that I I really want to talk about is Parcel and how very good it is and how um have any of y'all tried a project with parcel i did parcel 2 beta 59 i think can create react or code sandbox for like a hot second but that's all everything i have control of i use parcel anything i don't have control of is stuck in webpack it's stuck in webpack or stuck in whatever other world just the idea that like Parcel brings so much to the table already for you. It's a bundler. Uh, it's a compiler. It's a transpiler. It's a it's a, everything you need to build a front end application, um, except for the code. So, really, I mean, for people who are familiar with the in the Webpack space or in the even the roll-up space, I've used mm-hmm. Parcel to build a package, and it was frankly just easier. Um, easier than roll-up, huh? Yeah, yeah, literally That's pretty, pretty pretty easy then. Parcel build. Um, hey, it detects. Am I building a TypeScript file? Am mm-hmm. I building a, a JSX file? Am I building a SCSS or am I building uh post css and it will install its dependencies it'll create a babel rc that has uh very normal uh defaults very safe uh a safe starting block for you to start to add in your own configuration um it will compile and build your web workers and service workers out of the box just because you have added Mm -hmm. that uh textual link to a another uh, and it knows through like going through the uh the ast that this is a worker i need to build it differently and serve it also at that you know create a url for it it does so much and it does so much the right way that i don't know why i wouldn't use it that sounds magical as someone who hasn't used it really i definitely yeah wholeheartedly second everything zach said parcel is amazing I'm not even I'm not even on the beta yet. I don't think for version two. Um, oh yeah, don't do it. It's not ready yet. Like use it when it comes out, but not until then. The first thing I saw when I went to their site is ooh, a t-shirt or a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, again, monetizing that open source, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh yeah, gotta get the swag somehow. For the listeners, uh, Brian's wearing a daring fireball t-shirt right now. Oh, so, uh, I am correct. That, that was a that was a grouper joke. That's always a grouper joke. The one thing that I haven't really gotten into is 
some bundle sizing stuff with parcel like in webpack it's pretty easy to kind of set your upper limits to how big you want your bundles to be it's not easy but it's very possible i could see brandon's eyes again don't communicate over the audio medium but uh but in in terms of bundle splitting like you know more magic always means less control uh yeah and it does seem like a lot of magic right it, to me, it's got the right balance, though. It's got the right balance until you hit, like, a, oh, no, I actually need this later. You don't need that until your project is much further. With Webpack, it's too much control, and the configurations are all just uh, fighting against each other, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's complicated. Mm-hmm. The, it has an opinion about a lot. Like, it'll bring, uh, it'll always bring Babel in. But what else are you going to use? Like, what else are you going to use? You, you could just use TSC. Well, sure. Sure. Room front end. No. But no, no, not, not in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The fall of Rome happened before Rome even came. And oh. I think it's parcel. Uh. I've heard a lot about like Skypack and um... Snowpack. Snowpack. There's another one like no, Skype, ES, ES Skype build and and there's one that the the view people use. Yeah, and all of them require more than just doing a parcel build mm-hmm. or parcel start. So it's got a it's a real easy sell to me. Um, I've enjoyed it. I've the only ever problem that I've really had with it is uh setting up my test environment on top of the things that it automatically brings to the build mm. but even that uh i just need to read the docs so you know read the docs but you can start building things start building fast uh get that extreme fast feedback loop and um yeah i don't use create react any create react app anymore because of it yes hmm. come to the dark side so yeah what i've been seeing is just recently, you know, this this year particularly, a lot more push towards instead of like polyfilling everything way back to your ES5, you know, shipping some more modern builds and some older stuff um, and kind of dual targeting there. Um, that isn't something I've been able to look at at work at all, but... But it sounds really good, right? Yeah. And I don't really ship large JavaScript things in anything on my on my own on the side. Or the, the one that I do is just a single page React app, so I use Create React app. But like facilitating that it gets a lot more complicated um wmr which is in the mm. preact js world is is pretty cool because it runs um native browser modules in development builds and it auto like installs your dependencies um when you just start using them um you, you want to package that json so you're locking at versions so it doesn't you know pull the latest breaking version when your code doesn't account for it but some stuff like that looks kind of cool Skypack is interesting because it's a CDN that pulls from NPM, but it converts stuff over to ES modules so you can import it. I think code pens are starting to use that a lot. So you in your JavaScript file, you just import the module there in the file instead of as the script tag, and then you're referencing a generic window object um, to get it packages and things. And so I think just... Yeah, that's a good idea. Tooling is coming over a bit more, and they all support you know HTTP 2 and 3 and all that good stuff so i just think you know modernizing bundling and stuff is definitely a space that you know parcel is in that we're going to be continuing to improve on and it'll be interesting to see what makes it into the like enterprisey world of like create react app and what you know what kind of trickles down well i think there's a lot of talk about like what's fastest on the build like the uh yes modules is like is talking about how it's screaming fast and like honestly my build is not the part that is holding me back. It's the configuration to me that's holding oh, me back. Zach, I, I got some great examples of code where we may work together in that you will scream out of your mind about build time. <laughs> <laughs> My perspective on this, though, is that a lot of that has to do with that it, it does go back to a lot of times bad webpack configuration. The number of projects I've been on where the, where the thrust of the work has been fixing issues with webpack configuration this year in particular, but even going back like three, four years, is like absurd. Well, it's all just arcane, random configs, and the version complexity is mind-boggling. None of that webpack stuff is good, despite what they may say. 
Right, right, right. And I think like the thing that's been nice about Parcel is, you know, like Zach said, you never really have to worry about configuration. And I think as a result, generally speaking, projects that I've used Parcel on, maybe they're simpler than projects that use Webpack. Maybe definitionally, because they're not using Webpack, they're simpler. You know, I haven't had to be concerned about performance tuning my bundler for that exact same reason, right? And, you know, there's, there's definitely other aspects to build time too, like, you know, the complexity of the assets that you're loading and just how big the project is and maybe parcel projects are just smaller overall and that helps too like there's there's multiple indicators for this stuff right but i think you ha- you almost have to wonder right like it, it causation versus correlation right <laughs> so if, if more people you know it, as, as these newer build tools get wider adoption not that parcels particularly new parcels been a thing for like four years now yeah i i just uh it's time for it to shine people need to start bringing it uh, to the forefront oh let's stop talking about webpack let's start talking about anything anything else yeah friendship ended with webpack yes exactly now literally anything else is my best friend you know that <laughs> yeah. like, five minutes after this show ends zach will tweet that me i'm excited please do um you know that you can also uh just to kind of call back uh it's extremely easy to build a svelte app Ew. with parcel this is true so okay I might look at that because my rollup config is annoying. <laughs> like it's fine, but my my personal site has a couple of things I'm running through rollup, and I want them all to be individual output files because I only use them on a couple of pages, and so I don't just want to like create one bundle that I import everywhere because mm-hmm. I don't use most of that on the entire site. So I got one for you, Brian. Delete your rollup config and run parcel entry point. Yep. And see if it works. Yep. That's the migration. It could be. It could be. Yeah, we'll you can actually do npx parcel entry point. Don't need to delete any files even. Yeah. So the the problem is I'm also like adding it to the page using Jekyll and there's some funkiness there. So That's fine. Okay, we'll see. It, yeah, it might not do the Jekyll step on its own, but once you do the Jekyll step and then you bundle it, because that's probably how you have to do it now, right? Uh, I run npm run build, and then I commit the file. Right, because GitHub Pages is what's doing the Jekyll part. Yeah. So... Yeah, then this is fine. Yeah, your entry point just changes, and then you're good. So uh, that brings me to another another thing I'm excited about, which, which is 11T. Um, Ron and I dove into that a bit with um, the JavaScript JavaScriptMN.com site. But it's, uh, just cool static site generator. I, uh, I know we're, like, pushing on time here, so I won't talk... We've talked about that in this show in the past, but that's something cool. It was really good. It was um, a nice breather from the the Gatsby and its WordPress like nonsense, and it was a nice offline, not hybrid cloud abomination like Next. Yeah, and I'll just quick shout out to React Table, which I spent a whole bunch of time on this spring. Great for loading tables and stuff. Super powerful, especially with hooks in a hooks API versus a component API. I think Tanner owes us a coffee at this point. <laughs> Wait, do we owe him a coffee, actually? Well, yeah, maybe we're even. <laughs> yes, yeah. because we'll, with this episode, we will convince the listener to use React Query. Yes, do it, listener, do it. I mean, Matt's, Matt's already in. Matt's already in. I so. think we've done it. All right, uh, any other final year in review stuff? Otherwise, we can continue on to our Twitter follows. Um, those, those new Macs are really good. We'll talk about that in a future review or a future episode of Kit, but those new Macs, it's good tech. Yeah, looking forward to hearing about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, now we get to the exciting part, uh, which is new Twitter followees. Uh, I think we should have Zach start because this, you know, guests go first. Uh, this is where we talk about people who we have followed on Twitter recently, and we like their posts. All right. Um, yeah, I'll start. So the first one I want to bring up is kind of an experimental follow, as in... I definitely know there's a potential for some really good content out of this concept, but uh, I got to see it happen. And that's uh, DM of engineering. Basically, imagine Dungeons and Dragons, but the scenarios are uh, role initiative against your product manager. So, you know, it is, uh, I think, full nerd intersectional. So have fun with that. The next one I want to talk about is uh tokusatsu gifts or toku gifts is the actual uh handle and it is gifts of everything from ultraman to kaiju to all your high special effects um 
Japanese excellent uh TV, film, cinema. So you're going to see Ultraman. You're uh, probably not Gatchaman uh, since it's that's animated. But that world, you see your Godzillas, see your, you know, just bite-sized gifts. Um, uh, and last, let me just uh, point out, uh, it's nytimes.com. That is not the actual New York Times. Instead, it is a post-absurd satire of the actual format that New York Times tweets and uh, social media presence always looks. And it is, uh, it's fun. It kind of gave me um, Jurassic Park updates vibes. Nice. Um, I actually did uh, follow nytimes.com on Twitter now. I said I wasn't going to. But I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna donate at the Jake Tapper tier. Believe it or not, too. <laughs> there you go. That it all adds up. I just yeah. There you go. It's too late. It happened. Well, for me, I continued the tradition of uh, not talking about anybody I'm following and instead putting a bunch of music links in there. Um, but I said a lot of words on this episode, so I'm gonna keep mine quick and just say, uh, Taylor Swift had a new album recently. I don't remember what it's called. It's like folk folklore evermore or something like that. I don't know. It's pretty good. You should listen to it. The next stimulus is another Taylor Swift album. Pro- hey, you know what? Uh, I'd be, I I don't know how I would feel about that actually, but last but not least, I did throw in a Sufjan Stevens Christmas song because um, it is my, it is my solemn uh, charge as a, uh, as a sad indie kid to uh, mention Sufjan Stevens uh, at Christmas time. So listen to Jingle Bells if you want to hear some very out of tune people singing Jingle Bells, which is the right way to sing Jingle Bells in my mind. So there you go. Listen to that. This has been my Twitter followees. That's actually music. <laughs> That's so fun. I follow a few people. Uh, first up is at Broccolini, which is uh, Diana, who's uh, on design at GitHub and with GitHub Primer, their design system. I've seen her tweets retweeted a bit over the years and thought, you know, I'm kind of committing to following over 500 people now. So I'm like, let's do it. Uh, Yeah. So that was that follow. The next up is uh, Amy Shira Taitel. Um, She runs a YouTube channel called Vintage Space. So kind of space history and and news and stuff. Um, I followed, I've watched her YouTube channel for, for many years. um, So I thought I'd follow on Twitter as well to get all the content in all the places. And finally is uh, at Whipped Cream, who's uh, a musician I've been recently listening a lot to. So, yeah. Oh, I forgot carp. <laughs> you should do do carp before I go. It's carp time. Uh, I, for, I forgot carp. And that was the most important thing. It's probably because it wasn't formatted as a link. But uh, that was a very enjoyable sort of action card. I don't know if it was a hack, experiment, or, what, or social hack. But uh, click the button. Hashtag carp. Click the button. It's tempting. That's the whole. That's the whole thing. Is that it's just tempting to click the button that says carp with the picture of the carp. And, it's just and tweet, then tweet carp. And then you click it, and then maybe one of your followers click it. It's currently trending. It's it's pretty good to actually look at the hashtag carp in Twitter search. It, it is kind of fun. It's it's one of those things that like fits the very like internet thing of like something that's so stupid that if you explained it to somebody. And did not actually do it. You dissect the you dissect the carp. Yeah, you if you if you if you dissect the carp, you would just be like, "That's dumb." Nobody would nobody would do it. But everybody did it because it turns out on the internet, it's almost never the the idea that makes it take off. It's the fact that it's so ambiguous and silly and has no context associated with it whatsoever that makes it that makes it work. You know, like you think of all the stuff that mischief has done, right? Same sort of thing. It's like just doing the dumbest possible things imaginable on the internet. People will people will buy into it because it makes no sense. And by the time this episode is posted, this will be the oldest, stalest meme in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the listener will be like, "What? I don't. That was no, like months ago." It it will keep going until it subsumes all of Twitter, and it will be nothing but cart posting. I mean, you, you didn't tweet. You carped. A new social network. Um, okay, so I've got one one thing because I don't follow people. And I don't know why I've bothered following this because I follow the two people who write it. But The Margins is a, I think, what do they call that, that thing? Substack, wow. newsletter, blog. Um, 
the margins is a uh, one of those newsletters and the 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 two people who write it are pretty cool and i follow both of them but i followed this just so i can read the stuff they post from the account sometimes very nice so take a look at that um if you like the kind of intersection of business and technology analysis nice and i do well uh this is a good a good year in review um we don't really know what's coming up next year you know new stuff uh, i don't know if we want to spend any time forecasting what's coming up for us or not but well i mean it's obviously going to be more march yep yes yeah the year will be different by the time uh the next march rolls around just as long as we don't get covid 20 i'm good yeah march 15th 2021 will be like buffer overflow right <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're just gonna wake up it's gonna be like groundhog's day and it's gonna start all over oh no well, yeah, 2021, New Year. Uh, we'll uh, we'll be back in your ears sometime, probably January, maybe. In the meantime, um, where can we find you all on the internet? You can find me just about anywhere, but especially on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN, where I tweet about things. Actually, you probably can't find me there because I'm on private right now. But you know, if 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 you could find me there, you'd probably see some pictures of bread and some more uh, silly jokes. I don't know. I had one recently about. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, environment variables that Ryan was also a part of. So yeah, I was there. Uh, but aside from that, I'll be using environment variables directly, like a grown up. Uh, oh, I have a package for you. Actually, we should talk about it off air. Okay, we'll talk about it <laughs> off air. <laughs> uh, so Zach, you go next. Where can we find you on the internet? Um, also on variables. also also on Twitter uh, at Zappleby. You could probably figure out how to spell that. It's just like Applebee's, except without an S and with a Z. So, yeah, you can see me on there every time the Pomodoro timer pops. And um, watch out for tech-adjacent tweets, um, leftist memes, and just general obscura. Ryan, I'll kick it to you, I guess. Great. Uh, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Martin, and of course on my website, RyanRapperset.com. And of course, if this episode gets released and you somehow made it to the end, you can request a card at card.RyanRapperset.com and you will be mailed a card. Very nice. Sometime. Nice. And you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L uh, or my website, BrianM.me. Uh, where uh, probably on the 31st of December, maybe January 1st, I'll be posting my one second a day compilation from this year that I've been working diligently on. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I have one too this year. I've done it every year since January 1st and I had a theme and then that theme went out the window. So I'm, ex I'm excited too because I know you've done this for like five years now, Brian, something like that. Uh, I started August 2016. So this will be my third complete year. Brandon, did you say you've done it every year starting in January? <laughs> Probably. I don't know what time is. <laughs> you did say that, and now it is a title. So that is, that's all we know. It's not an annual thing until it's happened once. Yeah. Or, or until the second time. Yes. What you said was accurate. I agree with you. <laughs> However, I just, I just filled in my last couple days. So I'm on, I'm on, I'm full up. There were only like a couple days in March that I missed, believe it or not. And every other day I've been able to do something yeah it's like 24th and 25th of march must have been a rough couple days i need to backfill me watching star trek from monday <laughs> but that's like a that's a pretty that's a low uh low risk kind of a backfill but anyway uh yeah so you can find the show notes for this episode at the nexus.tv slash pk63 uh, i'll try to uh, have some of the outline of the stuff we talked about versus just links um uh, you can discuss the episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV, or on our Twitter, which is twitter.com slash the Nexus TV, or just tweet at us. Uh, our links will also be in the show notes. Uh, if you like what we're doing here at the Nexus, yeah, swing on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Very nice. That seems like an episode. So I guess we have to close it out our usual way, All right. which is have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. Zach waved. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.